the latest consumer price and producer price inflation figures from the USA will doubtless grab a lot of headlines on Wednesday the 13th and Thursday the 14th of July, respectively. CPI inflation was 8.6% in May, the highest since December 8, 1981, and PPI was 10.8%, only a fraction below March's 21-year high of 11.5%. At least the PPI data may be cooling a little, but it was still the sixth double-digit percentage increase in a row on a year-on-year -year basis. However, an even more important number is due for release on Tuesday the 12th, and that's the American NFIB survey, which asks smaller companies for their perspective of the world. Over 29 Amer million American businesses employ less than 500 people, and their staff represent nearly all of the US workforce, 99% or so. So this survey provides an invaluable insight into a key component of America's economy. The bad news, therefore, is the latest NFIB reading was 93.1. That was the lowest score since the pandemic panic of April 2020. And worse, the NFIB has gone below 95 just three times since 1985 and each time signalled a recession. The indicator got as low as 96 just before the 2001 downturn. Remember that US small cap stocks are already reflecting this apparent unease. The Russell 2000 index is down by a good third from its high and is stuck in bear market territory as defined by a one-fifth drop from its previous zenith. An upturn in the NFIB in the Russell 2000 would therefore be potentially encouraging indicators for any investors who are looking for a market bottom. On the corporate front, we're about to hit the second quarter reporting season in the USA. PepsiCo will be one of the first to step up on Tuesday the 12th, and then the big financial stocks will start to get in on the act with JP Morgan Chase on the 14th and Wells Fargo on the 15th. UK quoted firms will also be busy, as quite a few trading statements are due for release, including from half a dozen FTSE 100 members. Full year or half year results or trading updates that may be worthy of note include the following, either because of what they say about themselves, their industry and the global economy more widely. Although do note that some of these dates could yet be subject to change. So we have MJ Gleason on Monday the 11th of July, Purple Bricks and Emis on the 12th, Page Group, JD Weatherspoon and Renault on the 13th, Experian, Rio Tinto, Barrett Developments, Seven Trent on a big day for the FTSE 100 and Hayes on the 14th, and DCC, another FTSE 100 member, will round out the week on Friday the 15th of July. But the company which could just cause the biggest fuss in the week ahead is Burberry. The luxury goods firm is scheduled to release a first quarter update for the three months at the end of June on Friday the 15th of July. Burberry shares are down by a fifth in the past year, and they're now note trading no higher than they did in 2014. This is partly due to the wider market malaise here in the UK, the shift away from expensive quality stocks toward value names, which has seen names such as Burberry suffer a substantial derating, and also because of China's ongoing struggle with COVID-19, as lockdowns prevent potential shoppers and travellers from getting out and about. Burberry's quarterly updates traditionally feature just headline sales figures, plus some more colour on underlying trading. As a result, all attention will focus on the headline retail sales number plus the like-for-like -like comparables. Analysts and investors will also look to weigh how these figures stack up relative to the medium-term targets outlined alongside May's full-year results by relatively new Chief Executive Officer Jonathan Aykroyd. He took over from Marco Gobetti in March. Remember that Mr. Aykroyd's targets are high single-digit percentage revenue growth on a trend basis, and what he terms meaningful margin accretion on a constant currency basis. Burberry's operating return on sales was 19.2% in the 12 months to, uh, year, to March 2022 on a reported basis. Analysts currently expect total sales of 3.1 billion, an operating profit of around 600 million for the year to March 2023, and that's a margin of 19.6%. In terms of sales, Burberry reported retail revenue of £457 million for the first quarter of a year ago. That was a 90% increase against the prior year and a 1% gain over the pre-pandemic comparable. On a full price basis, the increases were 121% and 26% respectively. That £3.1 billion analyst consensus sales estimate for fiscal 2023 
means the market is looking for around 8% sales growth for the year overall, by the way. Analysts will no doubt look for additional colour on online versus physical sales, pricing and input costs, and regional sales trends between Europe, Asia and the US. Any further guidance on the impact of currency movements may also be welcomed. Back in May, Mr Ackroyd suggested that foreign exchange movements would add £159 million to sales and £92 million to adjusted profit based upon the prevailing cross rates on the 6th of May. As a final point, do remember that Burberry is currently running a £400 million share buyback program which is due for completion during this fiscal year. So any updates on that and indeed capital allocation policies more widely may be of interest. Thank you for watching. I hope that you and your families are all well and in good spirits. I look forward to chatting to you with you next week.